I'm with our Global Food Program, and I'm leading on the policy work in our Global Food Program. Um, we all know that there is an urgency, and we will not achieve a 1.5 target, uh, target if we won't change our food system. We are only seven years ahead from 2030, seven years to scale up and to implement the biodiversity, the land. agriculture and food systems in the outcome of this conference. We, we already, uh, and to say it very open, disappointed about the outcome of the Shamil Sheikh joint work on agriculture. So, and we are still very optimistic and I know my colleagues are looking at their WhatsApp uh, on the next uh, on, on the next draft of the global stock take because that's an important moment really to integrate uh, agriculture and food system in the global stock take and uh, especially as we want to scale up the NDCs. So what we really want to see is strong NDCs, nationally determined contribution with uh, integration of an agriculture and um, food system. Analysis we have made for the last COP shows that there is improvement and 93% of all the NDCs have somehow mentioning food or agriculture, but there is no systemic approach. And what we are looking for is really to, to have 100% systemic approach in the NDCs in context with food and agriculture by 2025. Having said this, I want to introduce my panel here and my speaker. Uh, first of all, Tony Juniper, he is the chairman and head of Natural England. Uh, Hasib uh, Bakhtari, he is the senior consultant of Climate Focus, and he's the one who has uh, helped us and supported on developing an NDC guidance for agriculture and food, and you will hear and learn more about this. Then I'm happy to have Julia Wolf. She is with FAO, and she's leading the SCALA program which is a program which is really on the implementation of NDC and NAPS at national level, because having global targets doesn't mean that it goes really on the ground, and therefore projects like SCALA are very important. And I'm happy to have Felicitas with us. She's the senior policy manager at the German Federal Ministry uh, for Economic Cooperation and Development. And even very happy to have you here, here Juan Lucas. Lucas. He's, He's the Global, Global Director of Partnership and Advocacy of CGIR and the Director General of the Alliance of Biodiversity International and the International Center for Tropical Agriculture. And with Juan Lucas, we have started this journey years back and it's great that you're still, I would say, in the train or in the boat with us to really work on a food system transformation. Having introduced uh, my speaker and panelist, I would like to ask Tony Juniper to a little bit setting the scene and introduce uh, the urgency of uh, food system transformation to us. And maybe two words about um, nature, uh, natural England so that everybody knows a little bit more about this. Thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, everybody. An absolute pleasure to be here. My name is Tony Juniper. I'm the chairman of Natural England, which is the British government's official agency uh, for the natural environment in England. Uh, we're concerned with nature recovery, including many of the overlaps with food production. England's a very crowded country, as many of you will know. Um, about 70% of our land is producing food in different ways. So if we do wish to do nature recovery in England, it has to be closely aligned with food production. And so this is a very big part of what we're trying to do, is to find those overlaps. Now, can I just begin by congratulating WWF um, for putting food so prominently on the agenda here and more widely over recent years? Because if you go out into to the wide world there and speak to people about what the big environmental issues are, they will say it's energy, they will say it's pollution, they will say it's plastic, they'll say it's transport, they'll say it's aeroplanes, and of course all of these things are true, but very often what we miss is the central importance of the food system in terms of the outcomes on a wide range of environmental subjects, not just climate change. Actually, it was quite striking coming off the tube, the metro here this morning and walking in, uh, lots of protesters with placards 
talking about fossil fuels, phase out fossil fuels, a perfectly good message, but it really typifies the extent to which the energy sector takes up so much of the attention span when it comes to the kinds of issues that we're talking about here today. And actually, you know, the um, agricultural dimension of this is, is pretty huge. So between a quarter and a third of emissions are coming from the food system in different ways. Land clearance, deforestation, the biggest driver there is still food production. Uh, the livestock and the methane emissions that follow in the wake of deforestation, a big component. The diesel, uh, which is employed in uh, farm machinery. The manufacture of the ammonium nitrate fertilizers, uh, which come with a very big carbon footprint and water footprint. The manufacture of pesticides. All of these things add up to a very big uh, carbon contribution and, of course, the degradation of soils too, principally being caused by industrial farming, recognising that there's more carbon in soils than there is in all of the vegetation put together above ground, and you see the depletion of soil carbon uh, driven by agriculture making a very significant contribution to the warming that's now underway. Now, on top of all of that, of course, we know that the other major global environmental emergency, the mass extinction and the decline of biodiversity worldwide, the biggest single contributor to that, of course, is our food system, and for those very same reasons of deforestation, but also following the clearance of natural habitats to make way for agriculture is the pollution that comes in its wake, and not only in terms of the contamination of terrestrial ecosystems, but also pesticides and fertilizers getting into coastal waters, leading to impacts there. Now, these things are increasingly well documented. They're increasingly well understood, the impacts on the climate and on the biosphere. And yet, we find ourselves stuck in a position where we still find many leaders, both in industry and in government, saying that actually food security is more important than these environmental questions. And of course, this misses the very fact that the economic sector, which is most imperiled by environmental change, whether it's to do with the climate or the loss of biodiversity, that sector that's most vulnerable is, of course, the food system. And so this is not one of those questions where it's a simple either or. It must be a both and. If we are going to deal with these huge questions of climate warming and biodiversity loss at the same time, as protecting global food security, we have to do both of these things together, not choose between them. And this is why this global stock take is so important, is to get across the message that this is not a choice we need to take, it's about an integrated approach that has to be part of the future, uh, not only for the environment, but also for people's food security. Now, what this requires, and this is common across the whole piece when it comes to sustainability, is we have to shift from silo thinking and into systems thinking. Because at the moment, when it comes to the food system, we talk about one subject at a time. And actually, in the British media, you see it quite a bit. Uh, one day, it's obesity. The next day, it's trading arrangements. The following day, it's affordability. The next time, we hear about biodiversity. Then there's a story about pesticides. Then there's one about carbon. And then there's one about the uh, global kind of access to food and who's got secure supplies. The fact is, of course, all of these things are connected. And that's why we need a systemic approach to be able to deal with them. And taking some of these uh, thoughts into this global stock take would be one very important way of doing that. And so um, it seems to me that this is an opportunity that we have at COP28 is to lift our ambitions, not only in terms of the individual sectors, but to start thinking about the system. Because if we don't think about the system, then we're not thinking about future security and not only for the environment, but for people. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And Thank you, and especially for, for, uh, for emphasizing we don't have a choice, yeah? And we have to get out of the silo thinking to a systemic, to a system thinking. And that's exactly where it leads to agriculture and food systems. And the global stock take, and you all know it's all about the NDCs. And just to reiterate, in the analysis from last year, we have seen there are a huge gap and there is not a system thinking. And, and this was the reason why uh, we have started at the beginning of this year uh, first of all, we have asked um, the one who are responsible for the NDCs and say, why is food not in? And we realize there is a knowledge gap. There is really a knowledge gap. What does it mean to integrate food systems? And which is on the production, but it's also food loss and waste, and it's also the diet topic. And 
And therefore, and thanks to the um, support uh, from the German government, we, we are able to develop an NDC, NDC guidance for agriculture and food, which will now be presented by Hasib. And um, this guidance will also have a broad rollout, once again, thanks to the German government uh, next year, because having a tool and having it on the paper doesn't mean that uh, the one who are responsible are working with this is. And one challenge we have in this context uh, is that at the moment we are mainly talking to the agriculture ministers, and this is again what you mentioned. We are still in silos, but we have to integrate and to communicate these asks also to environment, to health and the other ministries, and also breaking the silos within the ministries. I think that somebody mentioned recently we also needed an institutional innovation because sometimes it's in one unit and the uh, uh, agriculture and then climate is in the other unit, but to bring this together, it's also a challenge. But having said this, I, I want to introduce Hasib. Hasib, he has, um, is from Climate Focus, as already mentioned, and he will now present it, the main contact of this NDC guidance for agriculture and food. Hasib, over to you. Thanks. Martina, it's uh, a pleasure to be here. I have a few slides that I want to quickly go through. Um, but before that, thanks also to Tony and to Martina uh, for highlighting the importance of a systemic holistic approach to climate change mitigation, adaptation, biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse. Um, and I think food is one thing that we all agree upon, the importance of food, because food is life. And if we don't have enough food, doesn't matter if we have an electric car or a fossil fuel-based car. So food not just cuts across all the intervention areas and policy areas, but also food system is overlapping with all other socioeconomic political systems that we live within, within uh, in our societies, whether it's the energy sector or system or transportation or natural ecosystems or health um, and many more. Therefore... Um, is that, could someone put the slides? Sorry, it's here. Oh, okay. Um, let's move here. Uh, um, okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, this is good. Thanks. Um, as uh, studies have already shown that 80% of all mitigation potential in the so-called nature-based solution uh, interventions uh, are related and closely linked to food systems. So if we don't change food system, we cannot meet the Paris Agreement goal, we cannot meet the adaptation goals, we cannot meet the nature-based solution goals. So this is an opportunity not to be missed. Uh, and as Martina said, just quickly show the map where we looked at the indices of all countries uh, that submitted an updated indice last year, and most of them have mentioned food somehow in the text of the NDCs. Um, and these NDCs have been proved uh, from their previous versions uh, submitted in 2016, 2017. However, there is no holistic approach to food system interventions and policy making in NDCs or as part of climate policy making. And when we say a holistic approach, that means uh, including policy and strategies for implementation for food loss and waste, for transportation and food system, for food distribution, for food security, for health, as well as for diets and transitioning to a clean uh, cooking uh, at the household and uh, at the restaurants and other food uh, institutions level. Um, and throughout the past several years, several, and there are a few examples that I have here on my slide, but there are many, many more organizations who have pushed for including a more systemic approach to climate policy making, including in the NDCs. The reports from WWF Climate Focus, as well as the Global Alliance for the Future of Food, FAO, CGIR, all of them uh, advocate for a food systems uh, approach. Luckily, unfortunately, we just had the declaration from the UAE presidency on food system where 140 plus countries agreed that we need to take action on food system for climate change mitigation adaptation. And that is an opportunity I think we should really uh, jump on to enhance not only NDCs, but also their implementation as well as implementation of all other sectoral policies at the national, uh, regional and global levels. Um, one of the 
one of the things of findings that we came across from all these publications was that uh, usually policymakers and implementers, including practitioners and, and investors and financiers, do not have access to a website or a resource that consolidates all uh, literature, scientific texts and information, and policy insights on how to actually take action on food systems for climate change. That's why um, we decided to put together uh, a website or a guidance uh, resource for policymakers and practitioners on enhancing indices for food systems, but also implementing indices for food system transformation. And the theory of change behind this was this, what you see on screen. So bringing together all the, the policy options and objectives and measures uh, in this guidance, as well as cross-cutting, enabling uh, policy actions, and putting this in one place where uh, everyone can have access and use. And then, hopefully, after we have put together this website, we roll it out with policymakers and practitioners that will help them integrate these guidance material into, the food, uh, into their indices, as well as into the implementation uh, of those indices. And then, at the end of this, our hope is that all indices will be aligned with the food systems approach as well as uh, their implementation. Um, the, the guidance, NDC guidance for agriculture and food system, the website is uh, right now enti uh, entitled Food Forward Indices. So it will be uh, a website where everyone can have access to the material and it will integrate uh, as of now uh, 30 plus policy options uh, and uh, all the guidance related to those policy options. This is the f uh, starting or the landing page on the website. Um, the website provides a step-by-step -step, uh, approach for users to have access to, to the material that exists on the website. The material is um, divided across five intervention areas. These are food governance, food environment, food production, food supply chains, and food consumption. Uh, and once a user or policymaker decides in which intervention area they want to have access to uh, information and material and guidance, then they go to the second step where they will get a list of policy options within that intervention, selected intervention area. For example, if they selected food consumption as an intervention area, they'll, they'll get a list of all policy options for which guidance is available, including reducing food waste, reducing demand for diverse nutritious and whole uh, food diets, food system-based dietary guidelines, and so on. And once they select one of the policy options that meet uh, their priorities at the national level, then they get uh, a page where they can easily navigate uh, across different uh, components of the guidance, uh, but the guidance for each of the policy options is broken down uh, or categorized or grouped into these six uh, different groups. Uh, a list of po policy implementation measures, so concrete actions for the chosen or selected policy option. What are those? What are the core benefits of that policy option, the, the, the measures included in the guidance? What are some of the challenges, externalities, and trade-offs that the policymakers should be aware of in implementing those policy options and measures? Uh, and where data is available, there is also data on uh, costs. How much does it usually cost to implement such a policy in different countries? If there is data uh, in specific countries, that's also provided. Otherwise, uh, a more global uh, cost uh, uh, numbers are included. Then what are some of the monitoring tools that can uh, help policymakers in monitoring the implementation of these policy options and policy measures? and how they can access those, where they can find it, the list is given. This includes, for example, a lot of tools that FAO, CJR, and uh, NDC Partnership, and UNOPS, and others have come up in uh, monitoring policies in the food sector. These will be included. And at the end, there will be a few case studies for each of those policy options. For, for example, if a user selected uh, reducing food waste at household level, then there will be a few case studies on how this has happened, or this is happening uh, in a select number of countries to just get a sense of how this looks like in practice uh, to actually implement it. Um, and yeah, th that's uh, the right now the content of guidance on the website uh, that will be launched uh, next year, early next year, hopefully. Um, 
Yeah, thank you so much. And this has been, uh, just wanted to mention that this has been a collaborative approach. We have an advisory group of several, several uh, organizations working on NDCs and food systems, including the NDC Partnership, FAO, uh, CJR. Um, we have FAIR, uh, Diets uh, Related Investor. We have GIZ and uh, several other organizations that uh, uh, skip my mind right, uh, skip my mind right now. But uh, I want to thank everyone who have uh, so far supported and helped uh, the developing of guidance for this uh, website. Thank you so much. S thank you, Hasib, and, and thanks for um, the great work uh, Climate Focus has done to develop this guidance tool. Um, what you didn't mention, but I want to mention it, is that we have the five intervention areas, but behind the five intervention areas, there are 30 plus uh, policy measures. So, uh, and this is on these five sectors. Um, we also are considering to extend this. So, uh, once this is launched, and we also will now uh, pilot test this in the next two months with the NDC partnership and the focal points of the NDCs. And if we see gaps, we really are open also to fill in the gaps uh, over the next months. Um, also, I want to mention that this is a global tool at the moment. But implementation will only happen at national and regional level. And, and therefore, and we don't have one food system, so, but we have food systems. And in this context, I also want to connect this with what WF has done on the great food puzzle. And my colleague Brent is sitting here. So at the end, we have to really adapt this to lo local uh, conditions and to local food systems. And that's also something we are looking for over the next months. Um, what is important, I think, we to get, a, to get a little bit more a concrete idea, what does it mean? What is a food system approach on the ground? We have a nice video from our colleagues from Kenya to give you a little bit an idea of the benefit of a food system approach on the ground and at the end setting the frame in this global arena with a global stock take at the national level with the NDCs, the benefits will be on the ground for the people, for biodiversity, and for the livelihoods. And I think that's important. And um, over to the technique to show us the video. We had realized that post-harvest losses is quite an issue uh, with the fisher folks that we are targeting in most of these projects. So as WWF Kenya and the WWF Denmark and WWF UK, we designed a project that will tackle the issue on fish post-harvest losses. The technical advantage of the Kigali project that we are implementing here at the coast is that it's green. Basically, it's environmentally friendly. It's environmentally friendly in the sense that uh, the, the technology itself, it uses solar. 
and the refrigerant in the freezers it's compliant to the Kigali amendment uh, so it's basically non HFC at the same time it's low cost because solar is, 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 is quite an affordable uh, source of uh, power and at the same time these technologies it's user friendly For both sites, uh, there is a working maintenance plan that the community used to operate this equipment. Some members of the BMUs were trained on how to operate this equipment. At the same time, we went ahead to train the fisher folks uh, the fish at the fisher level, uh, the traders on issues on sustainable fisheries, uh, fish post-harvest losses, uh, fish handling, and also issues on financial management. But we are saying that this is not the end. We have other projects that are coming in that are going to be supporting the fisher folk communities along the coast on these aspects. Aspects on sustainable fisheries, aspects on fish post harvest handling, aspects on governance structures. These are something that are continuous for us. And the partnership that we have fostered with the government and also the national government will play a very key role in us attaining all our sustainable fisheries goals. broad range of examples where WWF is implementing food system approaches on the ground. And what is also important is to, to share this knowledge. That's why uh, the NDC guidance also has a range of case studies and examples, not only from WWF, but also from our partners, FAO, UNIP, CGIR. I saw Chiara sitting. She also gave a lot of support on the development of this tool and um, of uh, another publication we will launch on Sunday, which is an NDC guidance tool, where we have collected examples of uh, implementation of NDCs and NAPs. It's a collection of examples of, um, of tools which are available, and it's not only the one for food and agriculture, but there are a lot of other tools, and it also gives guidance on the implementation of NDCs um, at a broader level. So have a look on the websites. It's launched on the WWF website, WWF and our partners. Um, having said this, I, I want to introduce my, my next speaker and also panelist sitting at this side, Julia. Julia Wolf was also involved and she and her team in the development um, of the guidance and in the NDC toolkit. And Julia, will, you will present and tell us a little bit about an FAO report, the global analysis of NDCs, um, which I understood will be published or is, will be published um, in, in the next month. So over to you to let us know a little bit about this publication. Thank you so much and uh, sorry, I. We'll say a couple of introductory words, if you don't mind, before I talk about analysis. So I think uh, well done, WWF, to place the side event today, because today is really the, the start of the second week, meaning everything that hasn't been solved on a GSD in the first week will go to the head of um, delegation. So the, tonight, as you all know, now there's a scheduled 7 to 8 um, o'clock appointment open to observers so far on looking at the global stock tech. And the reason why this is extremely important, and it's, it's really a shout out to all the governments, and I see some here in the room, um, to try to, to make sure that some language, whatever language it is, is, has to be in the global stock tech. And why is that? And I just wanted to explain that quickly from, from our perspective, because with the failed 
agriculture negotiation, which are still under the convention. No? So whenever you have agriculture negotiations, it's not under the Paris Agreement, right? And the GST is the core heart, one of the hearts of the Paris Agreement. So it, it would be making a big change if there would be some notion on agriculture, agri-food systems, food security, because so far what we have in the Paris Agreement is a reference and the preamble of the Paris Agreement. And I'm talking 2015, as you know, right? So they also say that this COP is kind of the next important COP after the Paris Agreement when it comes to global stock tech. I mean, that's not my, my view, but I heard um, s uh, people saying that. So I, I just wanted to, to really compliment WWF to stage the topic, not just on these NDC, but in relation to the global stock tech, which are really key. And, and this comes um, as to talk about uh, the NDCs as an instrument. No? And, and I think it's also great that you showcase, uh, which um, means yeah, not everything, everywhere, all at once. In the end, we are all working for uh, the most vulnerable affected by climate change, which in many cases are the farmers. And, and the other point I, I wanted to make before giving you a kind of a, a, a quick preview on, on the FAO analysis we've done is one of the key um, challenges we had is that agriculture sec has been always considered as a sector. No? So agri-food systems is still perceived by many negotiators as a sector. And, and Tony, you explained that so nicely. Why the hell do we have to take a systems lens and we have to stop about uh, thinking about the sector? Because also energy is there, right? There's a lot of negotiation texts in all kinds of shapes where you have a reference to energy. So in that sen in sense, we wish to see more a system reference to make sure that we are on track with um, the, uh, the adaptation and mitigation measures that need to be taken for keeping the 1.5 degree report. But that's just my political <laughs> sharing of, of where we are. So let's, let me quickly um, go to the global analysis. So we, we've done that ever since 2015. And the good news is that there's actually an increase of notion on the, in the NDCs um, on agriculture, food security, and food systems. And what you can see here is, and, and this compares to what uh, was showed by WWF, um, and you can take that from the report, um, there's a 94% reference to adaptation in the agri-food systems. Now, everything I'm saying is in relation to the agri-food systems and in relation to the 2020 review, which is now 2021, 2022, not? So you all remember there was COVID and everything delayed. So that's why we are now in 2023 and we'll launch this report. Um, next slide, please. Oh, oh it's me, sorry. Um, so on, on this slide, um, I'd like to highlight um, that, um, that's slide two. Okay, so w what's interesting to see is that food and water security are um, the most frequently reported climate risk in the NDC, you know? And, and what's really, I mean, this is just a number, and I, I'm sure you've seen that number many times, but I think it's, it's always good to keep the number in mind. Why are we dealing with the subject? Because it's the 783 million people that are most affected by hunger and, and um, really are the ones we, we saw in the video most impacted on food security and malnutrition. When it comes to low-income countries, you see um, a, a very high proportion. That, so we have this number, 26% um, of all disasters are actually um, affecting the agri-food agri systems. No? And this is in, in itself affecting the, the lowest, uh, low and lower middle-income countries, the LDCs, the LLDCs, and the SITs. No? So that you hear that often. Even in the negotiation group, there's all this reference to the LDCs, but it's really the, the first set of countries we really have to be thinking of in terms of supporting them, not only in the negotiations, but much more in terms of the, the, the support on the ground. This is a very complex slide, and we'll make that um, available, of course. So just let me share a couple of points. Um, so how broad is the adaptation in the agri-food system? So important it is uh, to note that it covers all the sectors. It, it's post-harvest consumption, uh, surrounding ecosystems and human system dimensions. And, and has a, in some, to some extent, you spoke already about it. Because often, and that's also very important to, when you work with countries, is to unpack what's actually the difference between agriculture and agri-food systems. No? So we heard already, it's kind of the, the amount of emission, like the 
the 30 percent that that comes on the food system um, and it's it's including production from production to the consumption it's the whole chain up or chain down as as as, as you want to see um, so it, it's really important to look at the it from a systems perspective and also not um, like really look at the socioeconomic dimensions in the chain, which is beyond production, right? So that, this is also like a learning um, that needs to be done within all of us and needs to be very strongly coming out of all the communications. So that's why it's extremely important that nations explain how they go about embracing an agri-food systems approach. When it comes to the hazards, um, uh, in, in, in terms of adaptation responses of the agri-food systems, it's mostly floods and, and droughts. Um, when it comes um, in terms of inclusive adaptation, it's really important um, that there's a higher incidence and a higher reference to the most vulnerable groups, because that's in, in many cases missing. And here again, um, referring back to COP28, you have the whole just transition uh, community thinking and reflecting on, on how the, the support and the means of um, implementation can be more just. No? It's uh, the climate justice. But this also can be reflected in the NDCs in terms of the ambition setting of, of countries. Oh, sorry, this goes back. Okay, in terms of um, mitigation, so um, here I'd like to say that um, it's really important, um, yeah, I mean, uh, mitigation is, of course, um, why the NDCs were initially um, created, but then it, it adaptation was added. And here I'd like to share um, that some of the numbers you see on the slides. Um, and it, it's really important. Uh, I mean, we see a 6% increase of the second round of NDC, meaning the difference between 2015 and 2020 um, and 2023 now. Um, so there is an increase of mitigation targets. Uh, which is really key. Um, what is also important is uh, the aspects of technology, um, institutional and eco-based responses, and, and also that the private sector actually is increasingly playing a role. And that's also something we really hope to see more um, in, in the next generation of NDCs in 2025. So not just a reference to the what, but also the, re and the system, but also the, to the reference of the actors. And the private sector is, is really key in that. Vina, so I'm, I have to practice this. <laughs> okay, so last but not least, um, finance. We all love it. So when we looked at the uh, NDC uh, finance need request, no? so you have different finance discussions, but we just pu purely looked at what do the NDC say on, on needed climate finance. And we could find a figure of 25%. Um, so why is that important? Because the current um, finance, climate finance, uh, the share of ODA climate finance going to the agri-food systems are 4.3%, as you can hear, see on the slide. So to match that need, which is uh, spelled out in the NDCs, you actually need to increase eightfold um, the climate finance going to the agri-food systems. So what's the message here? It's, again, we really hope that... Um, the finance is increasing, so that um, won't happen through the <laughs> through the revisions of the NDCs. But I think it's really important that um, it, it's very much more detailed out what the finance needs to be for, and also look at the different levels. And this is again a point on just transition to make sure that finance is um, not only uh, granted to countries um, in in, in non-conditional like grants, but also that uh, to ensure that it actually arrives at, at the most vulnerable, which is not always a given. I mean, there's other studies that say that um, actually it's, it's not so much climate finance uh, reaching the ground, uh, reaching the local level. And that's also something where we need to see the big shift because in the end, I mean, we can advocate as much as we want, but unless um, there's more support provided, you know, like you, you match the gap, but then also you actually ensure, and I know I see a lot of uh, friends and colleagues here working on that agenda. Um, I think it needs to be uh, very, very loud and, and, and clear that um, th the ultimate objective is to, to support the most vulnerable, um, both for, for, for adaptation, but then also look at um, where the, the countries and the, the potential with, with the highest 
rate of return on mitigation support, right? So it, it's because that's also a little bit of difficulty. Often it is perceived by by most vulnerable countries saying, oh, but we can't do all this mitigation. No? Mm -hmm. So it's really important to have a balanced approach, approach in terms of where mitigation can take place in a sustainable way and where there needs to be a stronger focus on adaptation measures. So now I leave it here. Yeah, thanks, Julia. And um, thanks. I, I first of all, I have a practical question. When is the launch of this report, or when it will, be, will it be available? A, a little bit of time frame. Yeah, well, early, like uh, the uh, early next uh, next year. Well, we'll we wanted to finish it for for the COP, but the problem you have is that some countries do submit the NDCs at a later point. So then you want to have like the best set of the the data available, but as soon as possible. And I I hope it's useful for all of you. If you have questions or clarification, of course you can write to to me or our FAO colleagues and. It's 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 a report for all of us um, as well as and, and thanks so much as well to to flag the um, the useful NDC guidance tools as well as the COP28 tool um, with many partners on um, agriculture, food, and climate national action. Right. So I guess and that's what we all have in common. We're trying to think. Okay, what do we do after COP? So I think after COP is a lot on moving ahead on implementation and with the tools available and uh, the countries who want to move ahead. Exactly. And maybe to point out two things, I think what is important and what needs to be really more discussed is the role of the private sector. And uh, this also has to do with maybe with climate finance or it has to do with climate finance. Also, the figures of the 4.3% uh, of climate finance is going in the agriculture sector. If we won't increase the finance um, and the finance contribution, we will not get to the implementation on the ground. And that's, that's very, very important. We, we have a little bit of time to, to talk, and now I want to talk to, to Felicitas. Um, from a government perspective, um, what is needed from the COP28 and from the decision makers really to ensure that uh, the NDCs will have a stronger focus on the agriculture and the food sector? Um, so, uh, a little bit listening from, from the Germans' experience and also from all the support you gave over the last months in also in developing the tool and the toolkit. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. And it's, uh, it's really exciting and, and uh, so inspiring to also listen to all my previous speakers. Uh, it's good to hear that we are all aligned um, in, in demanding that the agri-food systems are systematically included in the global stock take. This global stock take does represent the the opportunity for us to set the course correction to the 2025 NDCs. And of course, they're all, in the end, a means to the end of achieving a sustainable transformation of agri-food systems, which is what we need to address the multiple crises that we are all facing. Now, um, the German government, we're aligned with the EU in regards uh, of the negotiations. We, we, we clearly demand um, agri-food systems to be included in the um, in the global stock take, um, we demand that the global stock take um, guides and emphasizes the need um, to implement solutions for sustainable agriculture and food systems that contribute both to adaptation and mitigation, that incentivize this needed transition to sustainable agriculture and food systems, and especially when it comes um, to small scale farmers. Um, this should be achieved through an increase in agroecology, in agroforestry, in organic agriculture measures, all that reduce emissions, um, enhance soil organic carbon, um, and also include a reduction of food loss and waste and uh, a promotion of sustainable, healthy diets and gender equity. We have seen, um, we have all seen and noticed the Emirates Declaration that was um, adopted at the leaders' level. Um, and it's a, it's really a, an, a unique momentum that we should not just let pass on. It gives this um, leaders' level visibility to the relevance and urgency um, of including agriculture and food systems in our, our um, climate policy agenda. And now what is needed is a clear um, path also how to move forward here. Um, it, it's actually quite uh, exciting and, and I'm, I'm happy to see that the, also the COP presidency are uh, quite active in, 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 in designing a plan on how to move forward. They have, uh, they're, they're drafting something that they call the National Food Systems Technical Cooperation Collaborative. 
So, so an approach to, to see how can we use existing tools and existing platforms, existing networks, how can we better align them, all the different activities that are out there, because there are so many actors, we, we all have the same goal, right? But how do we align it? How do we really manage to unlock the finance, unlock the potential to, to get this done? So that's something that we are also excited to explore, how we can um, support yeah. this. Um, but then, of course, the, the, the global stock take, updating the NDCs, they're, 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 um, they're a means to an end, right? And so um, the countries, they need to actually be able to then implement the NDCs um, and all the updated policy plans. And, and here we just heard the, the financing gap that exists. Um, uh, I think it was 4% of international uh, climate funds that is spent on agri-food systems, out of that 2% is spent on mitigation action. Um, we see the repurposing of global subsidies as one game changer that can really help to unlock more climate finance. There is uh, currently um, eight, around 850 billion US dollars that are spent every year on um, agricultural subsidies, a, a, a large share of which um, is actually incentivizing environmentally harmful practices. So reevaluating how these subsidies um, can be redirected towards sustainable, nutritious, climate smart, uh, agriculture and food systems practices is something that we see as a multi-billion dollar opportunity that can really go a far way. And that is something that we're also supporting. We're working with the World Bank uh, in particular, who is working with national governments, um, supporting them in, in um, evaluating how, how national um, uh, funds, national subsidies can be redirected and, and help to align um, and addressing these goals. Thank you, and thank you, for, um, thank you also, uh, Felicitas, for mentioning the repurposing agenda. I think that's extremely important, and it's a little bit something we are always talking about, and it's good to hear that this is already going to be implemented to, with the World Bank. But at the end, it has to be extended. I think there is this urgency, and if I look back in the last um, months, years, it's always we have to repurpose, but it's a challenge, yeah? And I worked along in the German and the European common agriculture uh, policy and repurposing something. You take something away, or we don't want to take away, but to redirect in the right, in the right direction, and it's a challenge, but I think we, we have to work on this. And um, on the implementation, and this is my question to Julia, how is FAO contributing to the implementation of NDC and NAPS, and maybe a little bit also on your experience from the SCALA project? Yeah, thank you, Ma uh, Martina. So <coughs> the experience is that, so in the SCALA project, we have um, worked with a system lens, so that we developed a, a tool, another tool, but it's called a um, climate action review matrix, and it's working with the governments to go through the NDC, I mean, of the agri-food uh, section, let's say, of the NDC, and take them through a, an exercise of prioritizing climate action and identifying the, the kind of action that have most transformative uh, potential, no? because that's one of the first challenges that in many NDCs you have a high variety of different targets, you have actions, but, but it's not always clear what is the best um, transformative um, action to, to take and how to prioritize. That, that's one of the, the exercises we've been doing. What we also have been um, stimulating with the, with the Scala project is the work with the private sector. And that means uh, to start with a with dialogue, but then actually um, trying to bl bridge like this, this gap that often exists between the private sector wanting to have really ready-made um, kind of de-risked uh, proposals for action on, on the ground, um, and and that often is it needs a pre-investment from the public sector in terms of um, proposal writing, in terms of stakeholder engagement um, with a broader set of stakeholders. Not because it of course needs to be inclusive. Um, so that's also something we we have been um, had a very good. Uh, feedback and, and as a matter of fact, we launched like a separate facility, which was a private sector engagement facility, in additional countries, and um, it's it's kind kind of interesting. So we really got a lot of interest, both from global companies who who struggle to really place um, investments on the ground, as well as also local private sector, which is actually the the first target, like if you wish. But um, that, that's, again, something we see totally underdeveloped, in particular in LDCs, no? because LDCs are high-risk countries. 
So with, uh, with the public funds we're receiving to ICI, this is really where you can uh, put, uh, potentially install a lot of change because you're kind of preparing the ground and um, the, the pre-investment that the private sector will not do because they can't, because they have to look at their return on investment. It, it's kind of helping him to de-risk the, the, the potential investment. So that's just like two things I'd, I'd like to flag um, in terms of importance. But it's a long, it, it's, not, it's never a one-off. No? So this is why it's really important as a community we also share and, and are open to collaboration because it's not like one agency who can make the difference. It's really where, um, for example, with WWF or yesterday I spoke to SNV, you know, where you come in with, with your different mobilizing the civil society organization to engage with the governments because that's also lacking in many countries. There is no NDC discussion or NAP discussions like, okay, we have these strategies, so what does it mean? How can they... Um, be involved, no? there's often a, a huge lack of, of youth um, and, and young ambassador involvement. I mean, we all get used to the Fridays of future and they speak in many events, but in many countries, it's not a reality. It's not like they're invited to these meetings. No? So I think there's a lot of things that we can do, uh, which is part of enabling environment creation um, who, to then have a fertile ground for the investment, let's say, to really make an impact. Thanks, Julia, and, and thanks also to emphasize it's it's not a, it's only works if we all work together. And I think we we all could be proud what we have achieved in the last years really to bring um, food and agriculture to a COP. Yeah, we started a little bit in in Glasgow, and I think it's really scaling up. And we have a food day here, and I remember in Glasgow when I we mentioned to our colleagues. We want to have an official food day. They said, hey, come on. It took us 10 years to bring oceans of finance at a COP. And now, after two years, we have a food day. And I think we should use this momentum. And, um, and also, everybody who has any opportunity to influence the outcome of the global stock tech, please in, in <laughs> take your power, the power you have. I think we have an opportunity for one and two short questions. Uh, we're always running out of time. Are there any questions? I think we have a micro somewhere in the room. Ah. Uh, do we have a mi flexible micro? Because my micro is... <laughs> Thank you so much. Maybe introduce you. Uh, yes, my name is Stephanie. I'm part of uh, Yango, a food and agriculture working group, and also working in other constituencies as Climate Action Network and Demand Climate Justice. Um, thank you so much for all, all the work. And I wanted to ask you if you are considering when identifying like the uh, biggest transformative change, for instance, because this is also something I asked to, uh, to my own country when they were presenting NDC's uh, plans, uh, if you're considering also reductionist measures about uh, livestock, as in many countries, especially in Latin America, when I'm coming from, uh, most of the impacts regarding emissions and land use change are related directly to to this type of productions, and all measures are more like the feed of the animals, and and, and at the same time, the Ministry of Agriculture is announcing plans of scaling up the production. So for me, it was kind of contradictory. Thank you. Maybe a second question and... Uh Hi, thank you for this panel. Uh, my name is Nina Jamal. I work at Four Paws International. We're also part of the Climate Action Network. Uh, a lot of what you said um, resonated with us. We're not just working on climate, we're also working on pandemics. And in that conversation, we're also talking about following a systems approach. We're talking about the need for ministries to collaborate with each other, that this is not just something for one ministry rather than the other. Also, the quadripartite, so FAO, UNEP, World Organization for Animal Health, and WHO are working on a one health approach. But there are obstacles. There isn't enough interministerial collaboration. There isn't enough international collaboration. Uh, I wanted to ask what your sense is um, when working on uh, the global stock take. Do you? Do you already see opportunities, or, or is there a lot to be done still on collaboration? Okay, thank you. So, so who wants to answer the question, the first one on the livestock? Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, great question. Uh, in, the, in the guidance that we have put together, we have, as Martina said, 30 plus intervention or policy options. Um, the purpose of this website and the guidance is 
not to be prescriptive because nationally determined contributions are nationally determined and food systems are very diverse and context specific. Uh, the guidance is just bringing together all resources rel related to how we can transform food systems. What needs to happen on the ground needs to come again from the policymakers and the communities on the ground, and that will be uh, different across different countries, even at the subnational level, right? Uh, having said that, we have several policy options or objectives for livestock, including uh, shifting to sustainable practices, uh, sustainable grassland management, shifting diets, uh, meat heavy to more diverse and nutritious foods. Um, we do not have a specific policy option to reduce, for example, livestock production in any country. Again, that's uh, that depends on the priorities of the country, obviously, and the, the national government. Um, but uh, the Great Food Puzzle that WWF has produced, they have identified different policy levers across different types of food systems. And in countries where the food, uh, meat consumption or beef consumption is highest with uh, highest impact or production is highest with highest impact, there are a need for transitioning to uh, more diversified uh, food production, including nature-based solutions, or nature-positive agriculture, and so on, uh, is included. I hope that answers a bit. Okay, and well, Lucas, maybe you could integrate your answer in your summary. I is will it, summarize or do you want also talking to livestock, about okay. livestock, yeah, sure. Uh, is it, if it's okay, because, uh, yeah. and maybe I could ask, address the question with a silo to, to you, Tony. I mentioned it already at the beginning. Yes. Uh, so, um, well, I, I've, my thoughts, I think, were very much in the spirit of your question and this need for horizontal collaboration between all these different silos and how you foster that. It varies from country to country. It's different on the global stage compared with nationally. One thing I did want to come back to, though, Martina, because in England we're actually doing this, is the question about switching subsidies. And so one of the things that followed our departure from the European Union was a focus on the common agricultural policy and moving into this position where we now have this idea of using public money for public goods. And so switching from land-based payments to farmers into biodiversity recovery, into clean water, into landscape uh, protection. And just to emphasize that this is not simply an economic project, this is very much one which is about culture. And any country that is thinking about how you repurpose subsidies, just bear in mind the very strong cultural traditions that many farming sectors have in many countries. And so, you know, the discussion we have here about policy uh, and the discussion we have about carbon and about nature, it's meeting people who are in a very, very different space. And we found this the hard way, I think, in some of the environmental communities in England you need to be dealing with the cultural momentum and the pride of communities who literally for generations, even centuries, have been farming land in a way which has changed the uh, way the place looks in a way which people are very proud of and they're very attached to. And the switching of the subsidies, you're very often talking completely at cross purposes, having a completely different conversation compared to what the people on the ground are doing. And so I couldn't agree more with the sentiment in terms of the need to switch those billions of pounds into a different direction. But it needs to go with the flow of the farming communities rather than to be driven by, you know, the very laudable policy ideas we're talking about here today. And actually, it's good that we've got a laboratory in the UK and in England for any other countries that want to look at this because we're in a process of making that transition. And actually, one of the things I would say is that in making that transition, think very much about the just transition that we attach to the energy sector, and we talk about that a lot. I think we need to apply that question of justice and equity to the food side as well. Thank you, Tony. And I see you there is a lot, lot to discuss. And uh, before I hand over to Juan Lucas for, for the closing and also have a short feedback on the, on the livestock, I would like to thank everybody who joined us on this journey. It's the people here on the panel, but it's also Juan Lucas, your team, who helped us. It's, it's FAO, it's the ministry. So, But we have just started this journey, and we are not at the end. And I think it's an exciting moment. Um, and it's an exciting moment to see the leaders' declaration, but also see the 
um, actors and non said actors call to action. So let's start this journey and let's uh, um, accelerating the journey. So I, I feel the urgency still. And now, Juan Lucas, um, you have the last words on the closing. I have a hello all, the last words. No, time, no, no, you have, for you, like ten you, words. Have, you uh, have your three to five minutes and no, then no, no, they I'm, will throw us out of the room. I'm kidding. I'm, it's it's great, great to be here and I would like to uh, do a, a few things. The first is to reiterate, we met uh, with Martin in Glasgow and there is huge progress in the scale of, of time. So, so we need to keep positive and, and this is absolutely uh, important. And we see a lot of alignment in what we're discussing in this room. We're bridging uh, you know, the, this evidence uh, gap uh, into action and that's, this is great to hear. So I, would I will make a comment on livestock because livestock exemplifies a challenge that also is similar in other sectors, subsectors, etc. And of course, there is no silver bullet. This is a food system problem. It's not a production, primary production, but it cuts through culture, through the value chain, through consumers, through poverty, livelihoods. There is places with overconsumption that need to be addressed and linked to health. And there is places where hopefully these poor families have better access to this high quality protein. So we need to look at it in that, in, in that manner. And in my organization, uh, uh, the Alliance, we are working on that from the science. Couple of examples, we are looking at our gene banks in forages to identify compounds. This is very novel. That could be bred into uh, new forages that demethanize significantly uh, livestock uh, production. That would be amazing. And this is discovery and, and relying on agrobiodiversity as a, as a solution. And we're also, and next week, Shell, this company, is visiting a farm, a very large farm, that's using brachiaria and management systems. And it's probably going to be the first farm ever for intensive livestock production to, be, to certify carbon credits under a model that takes into account all of the elements required to certify carbon positive. So it's quite interesting, lots happening, beautiful discussions going forward. Uh, and in terms of the discussion today, I'll, I'd just like to rescue from, from Tony, integrated approaches, systems thinking is so difficult to, 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 to do that. We, you know, going to granular is the easiest uh, in, in our, in our uh, mind. Uh, great to see uh, this from Haseb, this holistic approach where recommendations, guidance uh, on policy options, case studies is being systematized and brought as a public good. I think this is uh, fantastic. So we have, we, this is provided uh, in access uh, to all. Uh, Julia, ver very clear on, on the global stock, stock taking at the heart and of course NDCs in relation to stock take and how we need to push food in there and hopefully in these coming days, and even if we negotiators don't get fully there, that that gap is also bridged and we manage to uh, bring uh, food very clearly into those uh, NDCs. The asymmetry uh, in the impacts uh, in terms of the poorest, low income countries, etc. this needs to be permanently uh, in, the, in, in the narrative. And of course, all this connection with finance. And with finance, it's not only this huge supply gap, but there is so much challenge on demand. Bankable projects, uh, projects such as the one you showed uh, for, the, for the fishing uh, communities. It's, there is very little of those. And we need to bridge that gap also from the demand uh, side of uh, point, point of view. Felicitas, of course, showcasing some, the, again, priority to focus on the small scale farmers with approaches that are agroecological, regenerative, uh, etc. And, and, and linking the, U the UAE declaration with this uh, emerging food systems uh, collaborative that should help countries keep bridging uh, those gaps. And of course, we heard repurposing subsidies is culturally challenged, but absolutely critical to meet uh, this gap. Just to finalize, uh, the first thing, uh, three things, two things. Uh, target setting needs, and this has been part of this, uh, science. And the trade-offs is, okay, mitigation versus 
food insecurity, livelihoods, nature, across geographies. That's the discussion. It's in those trade-offs that policy needs to uh, make uh, decisions. And the last thing is that we are very pleased to have contributed and be part of this uh, toolkit uh, to showcase pathways from science uh, that, that work uh, and, of course, uh, helping formulate evidence so those NDCs around food systems target are clear and are doable. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot and thanks everybody for participating uh, here.